Good morning. Good to have you with us this morning. It's a beautiful day. Hey, uh, if you haven't seen it, our steps are done in front of the church. They look, they look beautiful. And I'm very thankful. We're thankful. Thankful to you for faithful giving. Thankful to God for providing. You know, as we give, we're able to support the ministry of the church. Do ministry. Reach out. Take care of needs here at the church. And it's a delight to see how God provided. Uh, if you've not been able to see those, you'll need to. Just, just to give God thanks. Give Him praise for that. It's great to be together today. We're in Revelation again, and uh, we're learning, we're growing. We're seeing uh, just hope as we look at the program of God and of Jesus Christ for us, for his church. I trust you are encouraged as you are working through Revelation with us together. You're being challenged to be what God would have you to be. We're in Revelation chapter 7, and we're getting ready to start and continue uh, uh, a new section today. I'm looking forward to that. Our context, again, is Revelation 6. We've got to remember, last week as we were looking here in Revelation, God's wrath has begun. The six seals have begun. Uh, there is, initially, when the rapture occurs, there is, a, there is a peace that comes on the world, a false peace. The Antichrist uh, will, be a, will be a leader. He will draw people together. It will take time for him to, to pull together the world in, in the sense of, of what we see biblically in his full role as the Antichrist. Yet he's going to be answering questions that the world hasn't had answers to. He's going to have a what appears to be a, a, a wisdom, but it's, it's a natural wisdom. He's going to have nations following him. There's going to be a false sense of peace. That's the first seal. Uh, the second one, though, brings the reality of, of what he offers and what's happening in the world, and that's the reality of warfare. It's the reality of revolution, of conflict. Chaos is going to erupt in the world. It's going to be worldwide. It's going to be everywhere, simply like the world wars that we have encountered in the past. There will be, as a result of that war, there will be a famine, the third seal. Famine will be so bad that uh, it, it'll take a full day's wages just to buy your food. You know, what about your clothes? What about, what about the things for for your home. What about the things that you just need from day to day? It'll be just enough food to get enough money to get your food. Famine is going to be terrible. Inflation is going to rise beyond beyond understanding. Death is going to be exceedingly great, more than this world has ever seen, other than the when Jesus Christ flooded the earth in his judgment. Twenty five percent of the world is going to be uh, lose their life because of the judgment of God. It's it's been said there's seven point nine billion people, that's almost two billion people that are going to lose their life under the judgment of Jesus Christ here. Just the savagery of or martyrdom is going to take place. Believers are going to be slaughtered. Um, so much is going to happen in those first three, three and a half years. The world is, is going to change. The, the church is, is gone. The church is in heaven. When the rapture occurs, there are no Christians on the earth, none. And God is going to work. God is going to be miraculous. God's going to be a God of grace. But it's going to be an entirely different scene. The Holy Spirit's going to be removed in his role of controlling evil. He's going, to, he's going to take his hands off. So much is going to take place. And the world is literally shaken. A worldwide earthquake. Uh, the celestial bodies impacted. There's so much going on. Chapter 6 just gives us a glimpse of God's beginning of God's wrath. It's real, folks. Um, we need to believe God's word. Take his word by faith. And understand that uh, that he will judge sin, and yet he ex at the same time extends grace. The question that comes out of chapter 6 is the question that really stands alone in Revelation. It's a significant question, and it's this one. It's life-changing. Who can stand? Who can stand against the wrath of God? Who can stand against the judgment of God? There is an answer. We're going to see the beginning of that answer today as we come here to chapter 7. So let's pick it up in Revelation chapter 7. We're told here that more specific judgment is coming. Revelation 7, and after this, I saw four angels standing at the four corners of the earth, holding back the four winds of the earth, that no wind might blow on earth or sea or against any tree. And so we have these four angels. The, the four corners of the earth signify uh, control over the, the earth, the compass points, uh, simply the totality of the earth. They are holding back the winds of judgment. They're holding back maybe literally even the wind on the earth. We don't know. Um, but they're holding back certainly the winds of the judgment of God. They're, they're waiting. They're in preparation uh, to release uh, more aspects of the judgment of God. And we're told here in verse 2, And then I saw another angel. This is a fifth angel. 
ascending from the rising of the sun with the seal of the living God. And he called with a loud voice to the four angels who had been given power to harm earth and sea, saying, do not harm the earth or the sea or the trees until we're going to we're going to come to that in a moment. We have these four angels. They are holding in their hands. They have the ability to to re, to release the judgment of the wrath of God upon the earth. They are told by another angel who 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 bears the authority of God himself, the seal of God himself, uh, in, who rises with authority and power. He tells these other angels, he commands these other angels to wait until the right time. Do not harm the earth or the sea or the trees. I believe this looks forward to the trumpet judgments we're going to see uh, in a little bit as we continue here in Revelation. And so we see here that, that uh, judgment is coming. We need to remember that that uh, this is Revelation is about Jesus Christ. He's the Lamb of God, but He's also the giver of wrath. He's also the judge of this earth. Revelation is about Christ. He is the Lamb of God who gave His life for us, yet He's also the Lamb of God who will judge sinners who refuse to believe, who refuse to repent, who refuse to accept the gift of eternal life. So now, in these verses, we see that the wrath is coming, it's imminent, but there's a pause. There's a pause in, in wrath that's about to come. We're on the sixth seal, which will open up the, the seventh seal is going to open. It will open the, the trumpet judgments from the Lord. So there's a pause here that we see in the judgments of God. Four angels are holding back the judgments. We saw that. Uh, so these correlate to the coming trumpet judgments that will unfold in chapter 8, I believe. We have another angel. He has authority from God himself, and he reveals a, a precondition that needs to take place before these judgments will then continue and unfold. That's what we see. The, the precondition, the, the key here is in what's going to unfold in the rest of this chapter, chapter 7. We encounter, we encounter next uh, a group of 144,000. What is that? Who are they? That's the question. Uh, so we're going to answer that. So let's read the scriptures. And let's pick it up again in verse 3. Do not harm the earth or the sea or the trees until we have sealed the servants of our God on their foreheads. And I heard the number of the sealed, 144,000, sealed from every tribe of the sons of Israel. 12,000 from the tri tribe of Judah were sealed. 12,000 from the tribe of Reuben. 12,000 from the tribe of Gad. 12,000 from the tribe of Asher. 12,000 from the tribe of Naphtali, 12,000 from the tribe of Manasseh, 12,000 from the tribe of Simeon, 12,000 from the tribe of Levi, 12,000 from the tribe of Issachar, 12,000 from the tribe of Zebulun, 12,000 from the tribe of Joseph, and 12,000 from the tribe of Benjamin were sealed. Who are they? Again, I want to remind you, uh, how do we interpret the Word of God? How do we interpret the Scriptures? It's key that we, that we continue to remind ourselves of this essential. We, we come to the Word of God with a, uh, a literal approach, taking the language in its plain sense. What, is the, what does the language plainly say in the text, in the genre, within the context, and the way it's written? What's the, what's the context of the history? What's the context of the, of the grammar? What does the grammar teach us in the Greek, in the Hebrew, in the Old Testament, Aramaic at times? Uh, what's, what's the context of all of that? And so it's really significantly important because that, that basically says to us, God, we, we take your word at face value. We believe you, that you wrote, you wrote accurately. You communicated what you intended to communicate in the way that you did. He does involve symbolism. It's in the text here in Revelation. Yet at the same time, as I've said before, that symbolism is to be interpreted within the literal plain sense of the context of the passage. That's very important to understand. It's never just set apart and divorced from the context of the passage. And not everything that's in here is symbolic. While there is a lot of that here in Revelation, that's part of the nature of the apocalyptic literature that we have here. So who are these 144,000? God says, the angels are told, withhold judgment, withhold the release of this judgment until, until these 144,000 are, are sealed. Who are they? Some say it's the church, okay? Some say the church has replaced Israel. Some say uh, the church is spiritual Israel. Uh, the 12 tribes are the church. 
And so we, we see that distinction from some in the scriptures. And, it would, and I could, uh, we could put up many, many, many scriptures that they might use. Let me just show just a few just to kind of give you an idea of where they're coming from. Um, we are Abraham's offspring. We are the Israel of God. We are the true circumcision. We are a chosen people. We are a holy nation. On and on and on and on could go. Um, and so, and so there, there is, there is a, a number of Christians who come to the text and believe that, that the church has replaced Israel. That Israel lost her place in blessing because of her disobedience, because of her sin. And so the church is, is the, ultimately the fulfillment of the promises that were given to Israel. And so we are, we, are, we are Israel, but we are spiritual Israel in nature. And so, and so as they come to the text... You know, they would remind us that uh, they see the 12 disciples as, as the remnant of Israel and uh, that the church is built on that remnant and the church replaces the remnant of Israel. Okay. Um, and so that's, that's one view as to who these 144,000 are. And, and that view uh, is taken through Revelation and it affects... Uh, how we look at Revelation and what we draw from Revelation, uh, it's not a literal interpretation. It's not a contextual revelation. And it's, it's important to understand that. Uh, symbolism is in, the, is in Revelation, as I said. But we need to be understand that not everything is intended to be symbolic. Uh, again, context is going to tell us it's really important. There is a symbolic approach. Let me, sh let me just read a few things just to kind of give you a sense of what that symbolism looks like. Just so you can have an idea, okay? Okay. Um, there's, there's a gymnastic hoops that we kind of walk through to, to come to interpretations on some of these symbols here in Revelation. Uh, one is there are, there are good grounds for pursuing an alternative symbolic reading. The first is the symbolic use of numbers elsewhere in the book and in the wider Jewish apocalyptic tradition. If we assume that John is being consistent, then the number 144,000 should also be read symbolically. So it's assuming that all the numbers are symbolic. It represents the square of 12, a number of completeness multiplied by a thousand, representing a larger number. Now here's another approach to the symbolism of this passage that they would see. 12 is the number of the tribes, and appropriate to the church, three times four. Three is the, the divine number multiplied by four. It's the number for worldwide extension. 12 times 12 implies fixis uh, fixity and completeness which is taken a thousandfold in 144,000. A thousand implies the word perfectly pervaded by the divine, for it is ten, the world number, raised to the power of three, the number of God. I have no idea what that says. You try to interpret that, and you find a clear meaning to that, and you can let me know. I'm just showing you what, what is, is out here. Here's, here's the last one. The number itself is a round number, and all the tribes have an equal number. The number is a multiple of 12, which is the biblical number of organization, or possibly the people of God, and 10, which is the biblical number of completion. Chapter 7 is in ap uh, apocalyptic language, and the list of the tribes of Israel is slightly altered. Dan is omitted, Ephraim is replaced it by Joseph, so that a Jew would know that it was not meant to be taken literally. See, there's huge assumptions that are taken here. There's much symbolism that's read into the clear, plain text. And so we're going to see that I believe from the Word of God, from the text, from the context, that it, that it is the 12 tribes, the literal 12 tribes of Israel. I believe what we see here is that Jesus Christ is fulfilling His promise. Remember, the focus of Revelation is Christ. He's fulfilling His promise to Israel. He's fulfilling His promise to the world. He is being faithful to the Word of God. It's really important to understand. 2 Samuel chapter 7, we have the Davidic covenant here. I will appoint a place for my people Israel. I will plant them in their own place. They will be disturbed no more. They will be afflicted no more. They will rest from all of their enemies. The Lord will make them a house, your house, your kingdom shall be made forever. Your throne shall be established forever. He's talking to David here. David, your line, you are going to have a royal throne. It will be forever. Your kingdom will be forever. That's fulfilled in Christ. There's a land promise, specific, literal, to Israel. It says to, uh, God said to Abraham when he called him, Abraham, go to the land that I will show you. If it's spiritual in nature only, this doesn't make sense. And then in Ezekiel 48, verse 1, verse 28, and there's much there you can read. 
It describes the borders of Israel that God will give them in the future. It will be far north of Damascus. It will be far south. It's 100 miles basically north and south. And, 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 the, and the boundaries that we see here in Ezekiel and the scripture for Israel have never been realized. At the very height of, of the golden years under David, under Solomon, Israel never acquired the land and, and met the promises that God gave here. You can go and you can do your homework and you can study, but you'll see that that's absolutely true. This has never been this has never been met yet. It will be, but it has not yet. There's a new covenant God promised Israel in Jeremiah 31. The days are coming when I will make a new covenant with a house of Israel and with a house of Judah. He's so specific, so clear. It is with it is with Israel, it is with Judah. You know, these promises make no sense if Israel is not literally given the fulfillment of these prophecies in the New Testament. Then then God is then God has not been clear, God has not been faithful, God has not kept his word. In Ezekiel again we see this, the new covenant. I will give you a new heart, a new spirit I will put within you. I'll put my spirit within you. You will walk in my statutes. Be careful to obey my rules. As a nation, this is a national promise. They're going to have the spirit of God in them. As a nation, they're going to follow after God. As a nation, that hasn't happened. But it's going to be fulfilled. Jeremiah chapter 3, verse 17. In the future, Jerusalem will be called the throne of God. And all the nations will gather to it. To the presence of the Lord in Jerusalem. New Jerusalem. The nations will come to Jerusalem and worship. That has never happened in the history of Israel. If, if these promises aren't literal, then God has not told us the truth. Because spiritual, the, spirit, the church being spiritual Israel does not complete these promises that are given to Israel and more. The church being Israel doesn't meet the detailed requirements of these promises that are given by Israel by Christ to Israel. Now we have another challenge here. We have the challenge of the tribes themselves. Okay, The tribe is this. Who's, who's a legitimate Jew? And from what tribe? We have to remember that in AD 70, all the records of Judaism were destroyed. When Jerusalem was, was burned by Rome and, and, dis, and destroyed completely, all the records were destroyed. The Jews don't know, uh, are they legitimate Jews? What tribe are they from? Those records were lost. But you know what? Here's the thing. God knows. He knows He knows every living Jew today. He knows from what tribe they are from. He knows all of that. He is omnipotent. He's not lost those records. They are in His care, loving care. That is key. That is so important. You have the number 12. We're not going to spend time on that. But just a reminder, the, the, the Jewish the high priest is... He, he wore the, the breastplate, it, it, the ephod. It had 12 stones. It signified the 12 tribes of Israel. You have the, you have the showbread, the, the, the bread on the table of showbread in the temple, in the tabernacle. It represented again the 12 tribes of Israel. You have the city of Jerusalem. You have, you have the 12 gates. Matthew tells us that the 12 apostles are going to sit on those 12 gates. They're going to throw in the 12. They're going to uh, rule the 12 tribes of Israel. You know, these things just fall apart to dust if Israel doesn't receive what God promised, the word of God then is not true. And I believe, I take God at his word, and he has promised, he has promised national Israel a national restoration. He has promised them an eternal kingdom. He has promised them a land, a literal land. He's promised them to be the center of the worship of this world, the center place where then God is worshiped, not Israel. You have these 144,000 Jews. It says that from every tribe of the sons of Israel. You know, when that phrase is used, it's referring to literal Israel. To the physical descendants, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. If it's different here, then it's an exception to the, to the phrase being used in the rest of Scripture. It's an exception to the rule. And so there's no biblical reason, there's no compelling reason to spiritualize what is the plain text that we have here. Jesus Christ is plainly telling us that the Jews are going to receive a blessing not only in this passage but the passages to come here in Revelation and, and what he has promised in the Old Testament will be fulfilled to them. Yes, the church is, is a part of that spiritual blessing. The church is a part of Israel in that sense. We, we are, we are, we are uh, of the line of Abraham but we are not a national line of Abraham. 
We are a spiritual line of Abraham, but we have not replaced the church, the Israel. Israel has not been replaced by the church. Now, what about the tribes themselves? Uh, there is variances in the list of tribes. I'm not going to go into great detail, but let me just speak to it a second, a little bit. In Exodus chapter 1, you have the original list of the 12 tribes of Israel. You can go back, you can look at that. In Numbers 2, you have another list, another reading. It omits Levi. It includes uh, Ephraim. It includes Manasseh. Those are prophesied in Genesis chapter 48, Okay, that they would be included in the tribes of Israel. You have Numbers chapter 26. Levi is again omitted. See, Levi uh, lost her, her land inheritance because of sin, but they are still included in the inheritance of Israel. In Ezekiel 48, you have two listings of the 12 tribes of Israel. The first one, Levi is, is out or omitted from that list because, they're, because uh, there is an inheritance element to that list. But in the same, in the same chapter, you have in, in chapter 48, you have another listing, and uh, Levi is included, and you have Ephraim and Manasseh being represented by Joseph. The, the lists change. The lists, the lists, uh, let's keep going. Okay, let's look at this. And so what's key is this. It's, it's the author who's writing, to, uh, who's writing the Word of God. What's his intent in the context of what he's writing? Uh, what does he want to communicate? What is he communicating from prophecy? What is he, what is he communicating from, from what God has said? How it fits the context of what's being conveyed in that book and in that passage? And the tribes that are the tribes and the way that they are listed reflect that reality. That's really key. Um, now let's let's look at uh, Revelation seven. Okay, so we have Revelation seven here. We have a list here. Now it's a couple things that are true. Judah is listed first. Reuben is usually listed first. Why? Because he's the firstborn. Here it's Judah. The 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 line. The line of David, the royal line of the king, is Judah. John chooses to list Judah first because who's being reflected here? Who is who is in preeminence here in the book of Revelation? Of course, it's Christ. He's from the line of Judah. And so his tribe is listed first in preeminence. Dan, the tribe of Dan, is omitted. Why is he omitted? We don't know for sure. Uh, he is, he is uh, tied to idolatry and to apostasy. Um, very key. Um, some some even teach that from Genesis 49 verse 17 that that from Dan comes the Antichrist. I don't believe that, but but the, but that is taught. Dan is Dan is admitted, and it seems to be because of of the judgment of God. And there's not a land element here in in the list that's given. That's not the element. Dan is listed later, and the land promises to Israel, but he's not listed here. Um, at the same time. He's replaced by Manasseh and Joseph, but Ephraim's not there. If you go to Jeremiah chapter 4, verses 14 and 15, we see Dan and Ephraim connected together as, as co-leaders of wickedness against their own country in the northern tribe. And so there seems to be a tie here, uh, potentially, to, to that reality. I don't have all the answers. I'm not going to tell you that I have all the answers. But I understand all of this and all the listings, but I think these are... But what is key is that is that the authors the authors chose to convey under the inspiration of God a listing that that was um, in harmony with what they were conveying in the passage in the book of the Word of God that was given, and nothing of God's promises is left out. It's really key. Here, Levi is included um, because there's not a land promise element in this list here in Revelation chapter seven, and so Levi is included. So there are reasons why tribes are listed and why they're not when you look at the listings of the 12 tribes of Israel. Context is key. It takes a lot of study to, to, to determine what the context is teaching and how that might affect a particular listing, the way it's listed, the 12 tribes. But there are biblical reasons uh, that, that never contradict each other at the 12 listing of the listings of the 12 tribes. And we can trust the Word of God that uh, God is communicating what He wants to do and why He wants to do it. Now here's what's key. We have these 12 tribes, 12 literal tribes from the tribe of Israel. 12,000 in literal number are chosen from the 12 tribes. They are going to be used of God. So Israel, he's here. 
the tribulation has very much to do with, with Israel. God is purging Israel, refining Israel, judging Israel, and yet he's going to restore and use Israel. And we're seeing right here, even now at the beginning of the tribulation, that God is using Israel in a special way. He is, he is designating a specific number of Jews to use in a special way. They are sealed by God. In verse 3, again, we go back to verse 3 and we see that. Do not harm the earth or sea or the trees until we have sealed the servants of God on their foreheads. And so they're sealed. What does that mean? It means that they are under the, the ownership of God. It means they're under the protection of God. In chapter 14, these same 144,000 are mentioned, and that seal represents the name of the Father and the Son, we see there. Um, it is the seal that's given to them is in direct contrast to the mark of the beast, which is put on the wrist or on the forehead. And so we see that distinction that Jesus Christ is marking out believers in contrast to the marking of the beast on unbelievers, on those of, uh, in unbelief. And so we see a direct distinction that God is making on his servants, these specific ones, from Israel. They're being marked out. That's important. Ezekiel chapter 9 gives us a, a picture of God's divine judgment on Israel. And he marks out those who are faithful and protects them from that judgment in that passage. We see that as well. They receive a, they receive a mark, a, a seal, as it were. Okay? So that's important. What's, what's, t what's important here is that God is guaranteeing his work. He has a work that he always wills to be done, and he always seals that work, guarantees that work. That's what he does. In John, we see this. As Jesus comes to minister... Jesus bears the seal of his father, the seal of authenticity. The father is saying about the son, this is the real deal. This is the son of God. He is God. He is the chosen one. He is the Messiah. My seal of authority is on him. He is God himself. We see in 2 Corinthians chapter 1, the believers, we are sealed for all eternity. God has put his seal on us. He's given us his spirit as a guarantee. Ephesians chapter 1 just reinforces that. In Christ... Because of the word of God, through faith, we are sealed by the Holy Spirit. We are saved by the Holy Spirit. We are sealed and kept. That cannot be undone. That seal cannot be broken. It is eternal security. There's so much that we could say there. Jesus Christ is sealing here these 144,000 Jews. Second Timothy chapter 2 reminds us, God's foundation, it bears the seal. It bears the seal, which represents his omnipotence. The Lord knows everyone that belongs to him. Gentile, Jew, these 144,000, everyone who's received Jesus Christ as Savior, those in the Old Testament who followed him in faith, he knows all of those who are his. And all of us are called to depart from sin. We're called to follow after Jesus Christ. When he places his seal on us, it is, a, it is an affirmation of his call on our life. He says about you who are sealed, he says about you and about me, you are now marked for a task. You are marked, you are called to do my will, to fulfill my will, to carry out my will in your life. So what is that mission? What is that seal? Here in Revelation 7, what's the mission that they have? Well, they're sealed to do the work of God. In verse 3, we have sealed the servants of God. Who is being sealed? Well, 144,000 specifically, and they are sealed to serve God directly. Now, later in Revelation, we're going to talk about what that means in their life, uh, what that identity in their life looks like, uh, what that call specifically looks like in their life. We won't do that right now. They are called Jew native Jews of Israel are sealed here in the tribulation. 144,000. They are sealed by God so that he would protect them as they served him in, in the environment of, of the wrath of the Lamb and the response of the Antichrist against that wrath, against all, all belief, all faith, all believers, because people will be saved. Many are coming to Christ. And so there will be a response of the world against those who receive Jesus Christ. It will be swift. It will be brutal. It will be violent. We've already seen that in chapter 6. Martyrdom, believers are going to be slaughtered on a scale we've never seen. Israel has always faced the threat of extinction. The Holocaust, neighbors that surround her, that hate her, they could, if they, if they, if they had the opportunity with the snap of the finger, eradicate them. That will be the mindset of the world against Christianity during the tribulation. The world will do everything in its power to eradicate Christianity and Christians, and the slaughter will be great. 
believers will be martyred for Jesus Christ. These 144,000 will be protected. We'll talk more about that later. They are sealed for a specific work. They will be protected. Again, reminded, we are reminded of the purpose of the book of Revelation. Okay, Revelation 1, verse 1. This is the revelation of Jesus Christ. This is about Christ. It is from Christ. Everything in here has to do with Jesus Christ and how he ultimately is fulfilling the word, the will of his Father. That is key to understand. Everything that Jesus Christ is doing is a fulfillment of the will of his Father. Okay? That's what we see. We also see this. He has written and given revelation to John to communicate. And who is he giving it to? He's giving it to you and I, who are his what? His servants. He is communicating to his servants. Everyone who is, who is a person of faith in the tribulation is a servant of God, whether they are sealed as 144,000 or are a martyr that is brought home to glory in heaven. They are, we are, I am, you are right now, we are, we are servants of Jesus Christ. That never changes. We are called to serve him. He marks us by his seal that we might serve him with our life. We're to be a living sacrifice. We're to be a faithful sacrifice. The identity of Christ is to be in our life. That's true right here. The book of Revelation was written to every believer. Living then in the time of John, from then through the church, into the tribulation, into the millennium, was written to us. What's the purpose? That they would show us the things that would take place. What is being revealed in this verse? He's showing us two things in this verse. John is showing us two things. Number one, the most important, he is showing every believer Jesus Christ. Folks, we need to look at Christ every day in our life. We need to love Him every day in our life. We need to love the Lord God, our God, with all of our heart and all of our soul and all of our mind, all of our strength. We need to love Him faithfully. We need to keep Him the focus of everything that we do every day. It is the revelation of Jesus Christ and it is also the, the, the revealing of His program for the rest of history and what's going to take place. Revelation chapter 3, again, verse 3, chapter 7, verse 3, it is the servants of God. I want you to remember Israel's call. Israel's call is significant now to what's taking place here in chapter 7. Genesis chapter 12, they were called to be a blessing to the world. He said to Abraham, go, leave your land, go to a land that I'm going to show you, and I will make you a great nation, a great nation, and in you all the families of the earth will be blessed. It's Isaiah chapter 56. Foreigners are expected to be drawn to Israel to, uh, to join themselves to the Lord because of the testimony of Israel and have the opportunity to minister to God, to love Him, to be His servants, to hold fast to His covenant. He says, I will, I will make them a joyful noise uh, in, my, in the house of prayer. I will accept their offerings, their sacrifices. My house will be called a house of prayer for all peoples. That was to Israel in the Old Testament. But it was for the benefit of the peoples around them. Exodus chapter 9, Israel was to proclaim God to the world for this purpose. This is why I raised you up, Israel, to show you my power, so that the, my name might be proclaimed in all the earth. That's really no different than, than God's call in our life. We are to go into all the world and proclaim the gospel to make disciples. We're to do that. Psalm 96, declare his glory among the nations, his marvelous works among the peoples. See, here's the thing. Israel failed miserably. We often fail so miserably. Israel failed miserably. Jonah's a perfect example of that. We see that here in Jonah chapter 4. Jonah said to the Lord, Lord, this is, isn't this what I said? This is what I said when I was in my country. This is why I left. This is why I flee. Jonah says, God, I want you to know why I ran from you. I want, to know, I want you to know why I ran from you because this is what I knew. I knew that you're gracious, that you're merciful, you're slow to anger, you're abounding in steadfast love, you relent from disaster. I don't want Nineveh to be rescued. I don't want Nineveh, Nineveh to be saved. There are hated enemies. They would destroy us if they, if they had a chance to hate us. I don't want to go to them. He says, this is what I know. I know that you are a God who allows forgiveness. You are a God who, who allows repentance. You are a God who in grace changes people's lives. I don't want that for them. That was Israel's heartbeat too. Israel never never claimed that mantle of being a witness to the world. Israel never was a soul winner to the world. And so Jesus is, I love Jesus, don't you? Jesus is turning disobedience into obedience. He's turning failure into success. 
That's what he's doing. We're seeing that take place here. Aren't you glad? I want you to, I want you to know that whatever the failures are of your life, Jesus in power is able to turn those failures into success. The key is your will. The key is your submission to Jesus Christ. The key is Christ in you, released in you, yielded to him that he might do his word. The key is the Lord Jesus Christ. And so this is now being fulfilled for Israel in Revelation chapter 7. We're going to speak to that next week. We're going to show what that means. But here we go to Joel chapter 2. Boy, a lot of, Joel has a lot of implications. We refer to it much when, and as we look ahead to the future. Joel chapter 2, verses 30 and 32. I will show wonders in the heavens and the earth, blood and fire, columns of smoke. The sun will be turned to darkness, the moon to blood, before the great and awesome day of the Lord comes. Here's what's happening. And then every and it shall come to pass that everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. For in Mount Zion and Jerusalem there shall be those who escape, as the Lord has said, and among the survivors shall be those whom the Lord calls. There's a lot here. But Jerusalem, Israel, these 144,000 are now being given the mantle of soul winners. They're being given the mantle of serving God to a lost world. They're being given the mantle of being a mouthpiece for God to the world. We're going to see that here. I love that. The 144,000 are just a picture to you and I of God's grace. That's what it's all about. Because we're reminded that God's wrath is real. We see that here in Romans. We see it here in Revelation. God will pour out his wrath against all unrighteousness. He's doing that here in Revelation. He does that every day, but one day he will, he will bring all, all of us before him in accountability. And if we stand protected by the blood of Jesus Christ and in relationship to him, we will receive his joy and his love and his grace. If we stand separated from him because of unbelief, because of disobedience, because of no relationship with him, then we will experience the utter wrath of God for all eternity. Romans chapter 11 reminds us that God's grace is real, though. I love this passage. At the present time, there is, as Paul is writing, there is a remnant chosen by grace. All that was left of Israel now was a remnant because of their sin. There is now a partial, a partial hardening has come upon all of Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in. In other words, national Israel doesn't have the opportunity to, to turn to Christ as a nation. There are Jews turning to Christ today. Thank the Lord. What grace. But one day they will be brought back as a nation before him. And in this way, all Israel will be saved. The deliverer will come from Zion. He will banish ungodliness from Zion. And this will be my covenant with them when I take away their sins. That's yet to be fulfilled. It will, it will come. Jesus Christ here in Revelation is going to draw together this promise and fulfill it. Jesus is the giver of grace. He's the giver of opportunity. If one thing Revelation teaches us is that God is the God of wrath, but God is a God of grace. Throughout Revelation here, God is giving grace. He is giving grace. He is giving grace. Through these witnesses here, through others, we're going to, we're going to speak to that. We're going to complete this picture. We're going to show a picture in this first half of the tribulation. We're not done. We're not done adding elements to this first half of the tribulation. We have a witness to the world. Uh, how did these Jews get saved? How did they receive Christ? Well, we're going to speak to that. Okay? But God, is, God never leaves himself without a witness. God always extends grace. And here's the key, though. God extends grace, and he is right now. If you're listening to this, God is extending grace to you and to me right now. He's giving us opportunity to do the right thing. He's given us opportunity to respond in faith to him. That grace stops. That grace ends the minute my life comes to an end. None of us know when that moment's going to come. None of us do. And when that comes, grace ceases for the unbeliever. Opportunity ceases for the unbeliever. The unbeliever goes through eternity from that moment forward without hope without grace, without opportunity, without the presence of God to change them. The believer steps into eternity in the presence of God, hope fulfilled, grace realized, and everything changes. I trust this morning as you look at this, we're going to continue to speak to this, the 144,000. We're going to speak to the remainder of this passage. We're going to do it next week. I love it. But I want you to know it's about grace. It's about being a servant of God. It's about being faithful no matter how difficult, how hard it gets. That's God's call to us. It's being His. May God speak to our heart. Uh, may He touch your heart. May He simply call you to faith in Him. May you and I be servants of the Lord, faithful ones. May we hate sin and love Him with all of our heart, all of our soul. 
all of our mind. May the Lord bless you. Come back next week. Let's continue. Let's grow. Let's see what God does in our hearts. Thank you for joining us. We'll see you again.